comments for David. Ms. Heidi. So, David, I'm curious. You know, we, we all sign out cases all the time that are inconclusive, variants of unknown significance. So I'm curious to think about or, or ask you, as you think about whether to report out that last variant as, well, here's a candidate, but we don't have conclusive evidence to say it's causal versus reporting it out as negative because it didn't meet the bar. Like, you know, in thinking about the risk-benefit ratio to that patient and and what may or may not be done subsequently to try and solve the story. And like, how do you think about when you decide to not report anything versus put something out there that's inconclusive in, in the context of a genome exome sort of study? Can you bring up my slides again on my computer? So we actually have pretty tight rules. Um, I think one of the things that we've been very aware of is the amount of damage that's been done by variants of uncertain significance reporting in things like BRCA1, where people have had mastectomies based on the lab reporting a variant of uncertain significance, and it being misinterpreted as causal. Um, I think in a typical um, genome, you know, we get f 4 million single nucleotide variants, about half a million interesting structural variants. Just by random chance, certain of those will fall in genes that are interesting. And typically, I mean, when we've done mapping this way of, of interesting variants that fall into interesting genes, we typically find between two and 20,000 variants that are, quote, unquote, interesting. We are, I think, very shy of reporting out new genes, even with functional evidence. As a clinical lab, I, I, I think with my research hat on, those are the ones that are most interesting to go out after and try and prove. Um, but as a clinical lab, I'm not going to want to be the first person to call a new gene a pathogenic gene. Um, so I, I think we, we fall very strictly into this box. This is the, the kind of the box, and, and we were talking earlier, my, you know, we, we're relatively strict about following the rules, so we won't report out category X variants. We will often throw them over the fence to the research lab and say, hey, you might want to look at this in this patient and a cohort of other patients that we have with a similar phenotype, but as a clinical lab, we won't report out. Other comments? I shouldn't have shouldn't have stopped you quite so soon. Let me let me just ask as a as a dumb epidemiologist, I, I hear a lot about HGMD and, and the challenges and the and the problems with it. And and I, I guess in, in my own mind I'm thinking this is probably a group that wants to capture all the information that's out there and have other people do some judgments on it. But is there is there not some way to, to have it capture some of the judgments as well that, that we're I mean have we Anybody approach them about that? Yeah, we, we have, and they've said it has to be published in the literature for them to put that reference in there, and they will not override what's been published. So it's been very frustrating. One wonders if there isn't some way to work with that. Um, again, I, you know. Well, they just say that they're very honest. They have no, they don't have the resources to do that. I mean, they would have to operate a 24-7 call center to be taking info from all of us who are doing this stuff about what we think about their variants. Yeah, I mean, as it is, it's $27,000 a year to use that database for clinical use, for clinical service. So if you, uh, just in, in building our pharmacogenomics resource, we think, we've thought about this a lot, and the, I think the only thing that works is we curate as the author would have curated on the day they submitted the paper, when, when, when the sky is blue, the sun is shining, and everything seems to make sense. And then you have, so if you curate that way, then you can build on top of that uh, an infrastructure to say, eh, not so much, time has told that this is, but um, if you start making the initial curation filled with judgment, then you just have, um, it, it's, it's untenable going forward. So, but, but HMGD and any other database can do that first level and then on top of that have mechanisms. Right. Yeah. So, so why not have a, you know, a super HMGD or, or whatever that, that says, okay, here, here's, our, here's where we started and here's the evidence that then we've, we've evaluated. So, some of these filters that in the examples today, you know, a variance 20 percent frequency in Europeans, it should be pretty straightforward to pull out all thousand genome frequencies or all EVS frequencies. And, annotate them in HM, GMD, you know, in any, so obviously there's the corner cases, a variant was reported, but there were no 
appropriate control, so who knows exactly what's happening. But, but these extreme ones, it should be possible to flag all of them and not, not have to go through well, them repeatedly. So, I mean, like, HDMD actually did work with the thousand, with thousand Genomes to, to flag some of those Thousand Genomes variants that showed up again. Did they get Smith. flagged? I mean, I know we, we talked about them in the project a few so, times. So it's weird. They have some internal flag, but it's not distributed in the public release. It's, it's really bizarre. To academics, it is distributed for some reason. But yeah, because I asked them about that. I said, you know, there's all these variants that are at like 90% in the, in the ESP cohort. Can't you fix that? And, and they, they were like, well, it's not in, in the download that you get. <laughs> so maybe, you know, and, and, you know, an action item that we, you know, take out of this is, is you know, we don't necessarily have to make HGMG change the way they do business, but if we took it upon ourselves as a, you know, to, you know, make sure that a community action we undertake is to draw from 10 or 20,000 exomes that have been sequenced in the last few years collectively in a very accurate allele frequency and then publish that, with some of our colleagues over here, as a single paper with a single supplement that actually art articulates this then maybe we'd have more traction at getting that up taken by not just HGMB, but any database. And I would say just as a clinical lab, we functionally do this. We just have a way of, of filtering automatically, so we don't report anything that is over a 5% allele frequency. 5%. I'm, I'm sort of intrigued by the uh, the thought of the, the sheer number of in-house curated or fixed versions of HGMD that exist in the clinical population. I mean, I have no idea how many that is. Is, is there communication between clinical labs that could be used to help to merge those efforts into? Yeah, I mean, there's been, you know, that's something that we're trying to work on. I've actually had contacted HGMD and said, you know, because the, some of the UO1-funded um, collaborative groups are all sh sharing these stories and we all have our own in-house databases where we've, we've gone through all these, you know, efforts and we have all the HGMB variants, or and not all of them, but we each have our lists. And I, you know, I had actually went, because HGMD is planning to put together a scientific advisory board, so they'd asked me to be on it and I said, you know, I'd be happy to organize some efforts to bring everybody's data that has con conflicted with the HGMD um, classifications and try to bring that to you so it could be put in there and you know they haven't agreed to to do that yet but I think in form at least agreeing to form a scientific advisory board I think there's some hope that we can get some traction there it seems like the interpretation of very rare stuff is is very much a, rum, a numbers game right and and individual I mean it seems like I mean one of the things I liked about one of the slides you had up there where it almost looks like a medical note, right, where you're, you're like, you're writing a note about a variant, right? Um, and I just, it, it seems like, I mean, maybe HGMD isn't the appropriate sort of nexus for kind of organizing an antagonistic community ab about the problem with HGMD. It seems like what you want is something where, you know, everyone can contribute annotations from wherever they are about variants they observe in their patients in some addendum type way. Um, to get those numbers to be able to add interpretation over time. Yeah, absolutely, and and you know maybe Donna can uh, speak from the NCBI ClinVar viewpoint in terms of creating a truly publicly accessible environment to be able to do that, and and we've been trying to work with them and and hopefully make some inroads in that area. Other comments? Um, my concern is, is that the utility of um, the 
uh, HGMD, despite all of its problems, is because it's curated, and that's sort of what distinguishes it from DB SNP, right, where you can just put anything in. So I think that there does need to be some curation. Maybe the curators are identified as people who have a particular interest in one gene or another, but that seems to be an essential component of maintaining the integrity of such a database and engendering the trust that somebody would have if they were a testing lab that you know does their homework when they report something to you. And I can add to that, if, if you could put up um, number 14 on the screen. So in working with Donna and thinking about how to annotate the curation level so that, that who's curated that data, you know, this is sort of the scheme that we came up with where you know, within ClinVar there may be data at the bottom that is uncurated like data in dbSNP and ESP cohorts. But then the laboratories, the clinical laboratories that we're working with to try and get their data in there would come with clinical assertions, but it would be marked as single source curation. So somebody said something about it, and you see who said it, so you can perhaps pass some judgment on who that was. Um, and then there's this interlaboratory multi-source where you're actually co collecting multiple different um, curations that may be the same or may be different, but there's some ability to to find consensus because there's multiple ones, but they're still done independently. And then you get to the expert curation where you truly bring a group of experts together who in a consensus evidence-based manner collectively decides you know, a level of, of evidence on a variant and classifies it. And then there's some variants that now today exist within clinical practice guidelines that are can be marked and, and referenced to those guidelines. But that was our attempt to really set up a scheme so that you could have a place that has all data, everything from the only population frequency on up to the most clinical grade data, and not have to go to eight different sources that are different grades, but yet still have some way to show a difference in the amount of, you know, curation that's happened on that data. So it's just, a, you know, what we've been thinking about. I think some of it is, is simply crowdsourcing. I mean, there's a number of places, we, we have several people doing just what you, what Heidi described is that happens in her lab happening every day, what David describes. Some of it is just going to be creating standards in a forum like here and then bringing together all the people who are doing that uh, to speak to the same standard and just pull that data together because it's, it's happening. I think we just need to harness what's already, what's already happening out there and bring it together into one thing. Uh, David Dimick, you made you made the point that you're totally dependent, obviously, on what's in the in the research realm. So, if you had your druthers, how, how might you re-engineer what we do in research, uh, aside from you know single papers being published on on individual things that often conflict? Well, I I am a researcher as well, so I I I think that's a hard question to answer. I, one of the things that really would make a huge difference is just putting the bar higher for publication. I, 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 you know, I review papers where they say we found this variant in a kid with this disease, and it's like, and the proof that this variant affects the function of this gene, just because a patient has PKU doesn't mean that you found a polymorphism in phenylalanine hydroxylase means that causes the, the enzyme not to work. And I think for too many years we've accepted that kind of should we say sloppy assumption? Uh, and I, I think we need to really as a community to tighten up the publication standards to really show people, you know, if they're going to show causality, which I know is what we're going to talk a lot about tomorrow, but really they show causality, not just an association. And if it's an association, that's okay, but it needs to be described as an association, not as causality. And the trouble is association with GWAS has almost assumed a, a different meaning. Um, so, so I, I, I guess we maybe almost need an, another term for it as something that we happen to find in an individual, but we haven't proven that this specific mutation leads to this phenotype. Um, and so I think, you know, with the with the paper that everyone saw, with the with the retraction for the the 
the missense mutation from the mitochondrial group, I think that was a very brave thing for them to publish. Um, I think also it was a very important lesson for us all that just because a child has a variant in a gene and the gene doesn't function, it doesn't mean that that variant causes the gene not to function. Um, if there's not too many negatives and positives in a sentence. Um, so I think really tightening up the literature is, is going to be the biggest deal because then we spend much less time wading through. And I think maybe also, once again, on the literature side of things, actually getting towards a more structured approach where curators can more easily pick out what an author is causing pathogenic versus associated. Because I think, you know, one of the things we criticize the HGMD curators, but I think there are times when I look at papers and I try to work out what the author thought was pathogenic and what they thought was neutral. And I understand why the curators had trouble. Because, I mean, they're human and, and it's, it's hard to read some of these papers. So I think also moving towards more clear-cut requirement that authors say, come out and say they think something is pathogenic or that they think it might be associated and, why, and, and provide them to put in a structured way the proof for why they think that's the case. Um, I, I think those things would make a huge difference. And then the other things that have already made a huge difference, the XM variant server has been a godsend to all of the clinical labs. It's, I, I said to um, Birgit, who works in Heidi's lab, this will change your life when we stumbled upon it. And it really has changed our life. It's changed all of the clinical labs that I know's lives. It's just in a radical way. It's really, really useful. So. And, and that's just from a relatively small number of, of, of exomes. I mean, it's, it's uh, respectable, but imagine if we brought together all the exomes. And imagine if we actually had phenotypes to go with them as well. Yeah, yeah I can really start dreaming now, right? Yeah. Can you clarify? So, so this is from the, I mean, Gonzalo can probably speak to the exact number right now, but uh, about 6,500 exomes from the NHLBI uh, exome sequencing project from a, 6,800 from a diversity of uh, heart, lung, and blood relevant phenotypes. And how do people get there? Uh, Google EVS, EVS exome. Uh, GS, uh, Washington. It's a really exome variant server. It, in Google, it, um, it comes up. But it has, it has allele frequencies uh, broken down by ethnicity, but not... Um, no individual level data and no phenotype data. The other nice thing about the ESP cohort is you can actually determine that a region was covered to be able to say that it, a variant was absent, which is incredibly useful also. I, I should mention while Lucky's doing that, what he's doing, I think, is changing his resolution. Sorry. What he's doing is changing his resolution, and Mike has, has advised us that, um, that we should be at uh, 1024 by 768, which is a kind of a wimpy resolution if you like a high-definition screen, um, but that's what the, what the display likes. So um, Mike also needs to test everybody's machine around the table. He's tested only seven of 32 so far, so some of you could stay over um, a little bit later and he can check them or check them uh, uh, tomorrow morning. But Les, go ahead. I just thought it would be uh, worth pointing out this you paper. Talk into the mic. Oh, worth pointing out this paper, which uh, came out uh, last, late last spring, I think. David Rosenblatt is basically suggesting going uh, kind of the other way uh, with a lot of the, against the arguments that we're hearing to here today, which is to say, publish everything. Just sequence them and throw it into a paper. It doesn't matter if it's causative or not, just put it in a paper, which, I mean, so they really the question he's posing is not whether or not you should publish and it might change our question into whether not whether we should be publishing things, but what we're allowed to conclude yeah. about what our research. And so these are going opposite directions here. I'm not arguing for this. I just thought people ought to be aware of it. Uh, so I just wanted to amplify on the last two comments. I, I do think that if, you, if we have a more structured literature where we can publish something as English text, but we also have structured ways of saying things, people are going to be able to mine the, you know, lots of these observations and get consensus kind of properly statistically and so forth? Oh, I just wanted to um, uh, echo something that you said, David, about the fact that we shouldn't set a bar so high that things don't get published because it's been, for somebody who works with extremely rare diseases, I'm searching around for that second and third case and I'm happy to look at something where there's not 
great evidence, but I, maybe the, those researchers and I can put that together to try to create better evidence. So I wouldn't want those to be excluded. I think it's just important to document what the level of evidence is. But the, we, have, we do have to be a little careful with that, right? Because that's creating yet another multiple testing problem, right? If everybody just throws the stuff up and you find, oh, here's two people with inflammatory bowel disease and rare variants in the same gene, you have a huge multiple testing problem there. Yeah, it's a, I mean, a similar point. It's a, it's a really cumbersome way to, to, first of all, it's a cumbersome way to look for that second or third patient. And, Second of all, you have no way of assessing the ascertainment effects of what people put into the literature. So, so surely the way to actually think about doing this is to have some kind of a centralization system that's independent of publication. I mean, that's really what we want to do. You know, I might just note that, that six years ago or so, we were in the same situation with GWAS. Um, and, and that was one of, one of the things that, you know, there, there are two things that I think came out of the, the discussion that Mark um, so ably started with the, with the um, um, dysbindin gene, was, was that we came up with some standards. And we also, I think, in, with many of the journals, came to an agreement that, you know, if you're going to publish GWAS data, you need to submit those data to dbGaP. And several of the journals really got behind that. And now dbGaP isn't the be-all and end-all, but it was, it was a start, at least, to, to having some of the data available and I think we're in many ways we've we've kind of moved beyond that to, to get to a structured format and so maybe something that we can be talking about a little bit tomorrow is is what kinds of, of databases would be useful to develop and how what might we go about doing that as well as what the standards should be um, yeah I, I I totally would like to emphasize and highlight exactly that because we have this sort of now unique opportunity like the discussion has already sort of gotten back into trying how do we retrofit our interpretation and evidence based on a huge backlog of literature. And that's a notable and laudable goal to try and do. But we should also keep in mind exactly what the, you know, if we sit in a room like we're doing and we try and imagine a future that we'd like to have, what is that future? What is, you know, if, you know, we had talked to our, you know, future 20 year old, you know, 20 year future colleagues that said, if you had done these things now, what would those things be? And I, I think Terry's exactly right. We have to imagine what kinds of databases we'd want, you know, maybe what kinds of things constitute evidence and, you know, what kind of category storms for particular variants we want to rate in terms of evidence because, of course, statistically that's going to be the, you know, the first thing we're going to look to and, and I think it's possible to do things like um, rate variants and be mindful about what kinds of rigor those particular variants have been, whether or not they've passed a multiple testing threshold or what kinds of evaluations given studies that have been done and discoveries that have been made on those things, what that actually means. We can put that into a, into a database, into a way of structuring information, and then start to gradually build and document evidence that's non-statistical on top of those things. I think, you know, whether or not, you know, sort of, I think, you know, what Mark will probably tell us about tomorrow, sort of integrating evidence, I think, clearly has to be a way of doing that. And so we have to imagine what the structures of information that we have to sort of hold that information, and then what kinds of queries we might do to that. I, I, don't, I don't know how else we're going to, I think that's sort of what we should think about framing these questions. Because if we try and go backwards, I, I think we're going to get stuck. No, that's, that's an excellent point, and I, and I think we, we were hearing, you know, while, while you can look, in the, look backwards and, and find the history that makes you really uncomfortable, and I think, you know, the, the stories that David Valley and, and Heidi and David Dimmicks have told us should make us all lose some sleep tonight, because, you know, facing those patients is a really scary thing. Um, and, and yet, you know, we're really just at the beginning of this. I mean, you know, how many of these have been published so far? Not very many, and, and there's going to be a flood of them. And, and so, so, so this is our chance. So, so you know, get energized for, for tomorrow. I, I would say that uh, pseudogenes and paralogs don't just uh, keep me from sleep, but they give me nightmares while I'm actually sleeping as well. <laughs> <laughs> Worrying about them and, and calls we're making for patients. I was going to say one theme that we had been touched on briefly that was very relevant in the GWAS area and is relevant here too, I mean, causality is often a multiplex thing. And so it's not just the significance of the causal relationship, but the magnitude of the influence. And that some, sometimes that can be, it's almost impossible to quantify with such small, small numbers, but it's not something we should forget when we're thinking about what we've traditionally known as single gene disorders, single variant disorders, almost certainly are oligogenic. Um, 
I, I agree that we're just at the beginning of this, but it's um, it, the pace at which it is rolling is unbelievable. And I know that at a place like ours, which has a fairly prominent genetics group, there are clinics that are ordering whole exomes from a variety of commercial sources and using that information to deal with patients, and I have no earthly idea how they interpret the data, what they tell the families, um, anything. That's a sobering thought. <laughs> that's, Goodness, that's yeah. called Hop Johns Hopkins. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Right. No. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, the, the scary thing is obviously everybody wants to practice up-to-date, state-of-the-art medicine, and, and if that becomes the standard of, of what that is, it's you know, that's real scary. David Dimick, you have your mic on. Is that to make us more nervous? No. <laughs> okay. Well, it seems like we're we're at about a stopping point now. Um, Daniel, did you want to? No, I thought that was incredibly constructive and really sets the stage for tomorrow. I mean, we have, we have a lot to get through, um, but I think if we can, if we can focus on the, the points that were raised in, in, these, uh, in, in this particular session about the, the sheer importance of getting this done and getting it done quickly, um, then I think we can, we can really make some serious progress tomorrow. Um, so just again, to, uh, to lay out the schedule, we'll have uh, one-hour sessions from each of the, the different working groups. I would like to, to really try and focus on the discussion as much as the, the actual presentation. But of course, this is an opportunity for the working groups to show off all the work that they've done prior to the presentation in, in laying the groundwork for this discussion. Um, and we, uh, we would also ask, if, if possible, that the presenters in those sessions maybe finish with one slide, uh, laying, out, laying out maybe five or six points that they see as absolutely crucial to help guide the discussion, just so we can make sure that those, those critical points do get covered in the, uh, the, the subsequent conversation. Um, and on that, I think that's it for me. I, yep, I think that's it. Any closing comments? We, we start at 8 o'clock tomorrow. So, yes. We, we, this, is, this is the first time we've actually done live streaming, and we're very excited about it. It's not that we're behind in technology, it's that we're trying to do it at no cost. And so, <laughs> so this is, this is the, the no cost version of it. Um, but we may not have that capability. Uh, Maggie, so they were asking could it be posted? Yeah. It'll take me two days. Two, two days? days. Yeah, yeah. Days so, so it won't be in time for the, for the meeting. So. We, we can circulate the slides, though, from all the presentations, so those will go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you need, you want them like tonight, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. So can, can do you have the slides now? I have one. Uh, okay, so so we need so we have marks. Yep. So far. Yeah. Okay. If Heidi and David. All right. So so if Heidi and David, you can send them to Chris, and then you guys can send them to everyone. Yeah. Um, so you have the emails of everyone. Yeah, yes. We're done. Break. <laughs>